want to talk about news, don't want the drama. From no pretentious media, Madonna. I found me a great ganja mama. Oh, cannabis and coffee with some marijuana. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cannabis and Coffee. It's a beautiful day in these kootenays. Sky is blue, and I think it's going to be 30 above again today, which is kind of crazy because it was, like, cold last week, and I still have the heating lamps on the chicks, and I don't need the, the heating. The, they don't need any heat. It's hot. But that's what we need to get our plants growing, and now hopefully everybody's gotten seeds popped about a month and a half ago or so, and you're outdoors outdoor, or you're indoors flurrying inside, and uh, we have an expert with us this morning. Um, Ross Middleton has been an advocate and, well, a cannabis grower and patient for over two decades, and him and his wife, Deb, own BMA Hydroponics in Bellevue, Ontario, and he's my guest this morning. Good morning, Ross. Good morning, Tamara. How are you doing? Oh, always good when it's when I'm talking to you. So oh. <laughs> it's a great day. How are things for you guys going out there? Uh, things are really good. Our, you know, our weather's heating up too. We've got a nice sunny day today, probably in the mid 20s. Uh, but we're a little dry. We need some rain, and uh, we're not getting any anytime soon. So uh, if you, I mean, if you can get water to your plants, uh, you're going to grow some really nice big plants this year. Uh, but if you can't, you might be in trouble. Right. That is one thing um, if you, you know, have to have water sources for them. I, I see that uh, a few of our friends have set up little water sources around their plants and, and that they've got going outside. And that's really a, the, the initiative to do that. So I know that you guys have all kinds of fun ideas for outdoor growing. Why don't you start giving the listeners some of your tips? Some of my tips for growing outdoors? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, first thing you can do is, is go to our YouTube channel. Just put BMA Hydroponics in the search bar on YouTube. And uh, about 60 videos are going to come up and there's indoor, there's outdoor, there's organic, there's regular, there's all kinds of good stuff on there, how to make cuttings, all those things. So that's a good place to start. Um, but this year, um, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm growing organically. So this is uh, going to be a first for me. I'm uh, coming up with my own recipe. I don't know if anybody's ever um, read the book by the Rev called True Living Organics, so sometimes called TLO. Uh, it's a great book. It's a good place to start from. Um, now, there's been a lot found out since that book was written, um, but it's basically a sound uh, a sound advice on how to grow organically. Uh, so this year, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my own recipe, like I say, so I'm going to be mixing in certain elements into the soil um, to get them started. I'm going to be top dressing with other organic amendments by Gaia Green, and occasionally, maybe every two weeks or so, be making organic tea. So I'm going to be filming all of that, and I'll be putting it up on the YouTube channel. So if you've ever wanted to grow organically and do it the right way, um, check that one out when it starts to come up. Because uh, quite often people, when they grow organically, they, they fall back on their experiences with vegetables. And that's great. You know, with vegetables, you, you put... Uh, you put manure in the ground, composted manure, and you put worm castings, and you put all these bone meals and blood meals and all these other things that take a long, long time to break down. And that's great for vegetables because residual nutrients in a pepper or a tomato don't matter because you're eating them and you're swallowing them and, of course, you're pooping them out. Uh, I keep telling people cannabis is not a vegetable. Uh, what you're doing with cannabis is you're, you're, you're burning it, inhaling it, and... Uh, there's no exit route for that. So right. um, you you best flush your plants. You want to get all those residual nutrients out of your plant. Uh, if you don't, it's it's not probably not going to hurt you. Uh, it's not going to give you cancer or anything like that. But what it will do is it will destroy the aesthetic value of your cannabis. So if there's residual nutrients in your cannabis, it's going to burn terribly. It's going to taste bad. It's going to be harsh. It's going to give you black ash. It's going to give you all those things that you don't want in your cannabis. And here you've grown it organically. So you're thinking, hey, this is my organic cannabis. Sure, it tastes like shit. It burns like crap and it breaks your throat. But it's organic. Well, right. you know, uh, the, the secret to true quality cannabis is flushing all those residual nutrients out of the plant. When you flush them out of the plant, you get a great tasting plant. The full flavor comes through. It's not harsh. 
the ash is white. If you ever hear anybody bragging about their white ash on their joints, it's because they flushed all those residual nutrients out. So right. I highly recommend flushing. I also highly recommend organic growing, but the right way. If you don't do it the right way, you're, you're, you're growing organically, but you're creating a product that which is second rate. Right. And that, that is very important, the flushing. Um, and, and even too, like uh, one thing you start, a lot of people do when they first start um, with their with their clones or with their seeds is they start giving them nutrients too early. And then they wonder why their plants are, are starting to die and it's because they've got too much food. So that's yes. something I always tell people, don't start feeding your plants too soon. Because if you do, you're going to over nutrient them, right? This is true. Uh, it, it all has to do with the uh, the size of the plant and, uh, by default, the size of the root zone. So if you're in a small container with a small root zone, you certainly don't want to be feeding a full dose of food. Uh, in fact, until they have an established root zone and you pot up to at least like a one-gallon pot or something like that, you really, like you say, you don't want to feed it at all. But once you do get it onto, a, say, its uh, fourth set of leaves and you pot it up into at least a one-gallon pot, you can start to feed it, but you want to feed it at like one quarter of the dose you would for a full grown plant. Right. And then gradually scale that up. As the root zone increases, as the pot size gets larger, you can then gradually bring your nutrient uh, dosage up to full dose. Right. Now, do you suggest fertilizing or nutri like every feed, or do you suggest doing a water pH balance, water in between? Like there are so many, there's so much good, you know, good advice out there. I know myself personally, I don't feed nutrients every feed. I find sometimes it gets them to be, you know, locked in with a neutral lock. So I just do an auto, like I do a feed and then I do a water, pH balance water, and then I do a feed. Is that what you suggest too, or what do you suggest? Yes, it's it, but it's conditional. So um, for the more advanced growers, I, I yes, use it full strength and maybe feed twice and then water once, you know, so two feeds, one plain water, two feeds, one plain water. Uh, but for the for the newbies, uh, what I do is I, I make it easy for them. So I make it so that they can feed every time they water. And then that way they don't have to try to remember, oh, did I feed last time or didn't I? So I cut the dose down to about a two-thirds dose. And then you can use it every time you water. So that just simplifies it for the first-time growers and stuff like that. And as they advance, if they want to try to uh, bring it up to the full dose and go through that that uh, feed feed water regimen, that's fine. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we're getting a, still even this year, even though it's uh, what I think the third year of outdoor growing legally for four plants, we still have a lot of new people coming in. Oh, so, absolutely! I yeah, mean, so, this year too, like for myself, like I've had more people asking me for clones this year than I've had in ten years. And unfortunately, I don't have any to give, to give away because I, I ended up with spider mites and I had to rip everything down. And I'm starting fresh this year myself. So, yeah. I, you know, and I was lucky enough to be able to get some clothes, but I don't have, I've got two. Yeah. <laughs> so you took, you took cuttings from someone, right? I actually, um, yes, I actually went out to our reserve. Uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, number one way of getting disease and bugs is to buy it off a reserve. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we got tiny Nega right here, and uh, uh, probably twenty percent of the sources of starting materials out there are really good, clean, nice plants. But I got to tell you, eighty percent of them, uh, you got powdery mildew, you got some other disease, or you got some sort of bug. Uh, so whenever people start coming in midsummer and they say, oh, I've got powdery mildew so bad, the first thing I do is look at them and say, you bought a cutting on the res, didn't you? And it's like, <laughs> well, how did you know? Well, <laughs> that's how I know. But, but um, again, they, like sometimes if, if someone walks in with a tray of cuttings into, a, into one of the dispensaries and says, hey, you want to buy my cuttings? And they say, sure, I'll give you five bucks a clone. And they say, okay, great, thank you. And they walk out and nobody, you know, looks Jackson. at them. Yeah. Some of them don't even have a light that they put them under because they sell in two days, so they just sit on the counter. But when that, you know, the, but there are others who actually make their own cuttings, and and those are the ones that I truly support and try to recommend to my these customers. These guys, yeah, these guys are actually like it's a really small operation. 
they're actually growing right out there beside where they where the yes. where their where their dispensary is. I know yeah. both these guys. Um, these are beautiful clones. I wouldn't. Yes. Yeah, they're beautiful. So, and I had somebody else offer me ones that were the ones that got me spider mites last year, and I kindly mm -hmm. turned them down. <laughs> yeah. Because I just don't want to have to go through that again. Because they were beautiful, oh. and then all of a sudden I ended with bugs, and so I've done everything that I possibly can this year to stay away from that problem. So. Yeah. And I mean, well, I've only got two because I said, again, we're still in the same power situation that we've been in for the last six years. So I can't put any more lights in here. <laughs> so the but, bugs, bugs and, and, and of course, uh, diseases like powdery mildew are really two, two different things. Indoors, they're, they're, they're both a big problem. Yes. Uh, but outdoors, if you're growing outdoors and you've got spider mites or you've got thrips or you've got, you know, any kind of bug indoors, you put those outdoors and there's natural predators out there who are constantly eating those bugs and they will keep them in check. So right. you, you, uh, your outdoor plant, it has probably aphids and thrips and spider mites on it, but you don't know because you don't see them because they're constantly getting predated upon. They're getting eaten by other predator insects. And when, and they've, they've evolved with this situation in the great outdoors where they're constantly being eaten by predators. So they learn how to reproduce prolifically so that they're making thousands and thousands and thousands of babies. And that's fine outdoors because it just feeds the predators. But when you take those plants indoors, the predators stay outdoors, but they don't care. They're still reproducing like they're getting eaten and they're not. So now you have an infestation, you get webbing or you get other issues. Like I, I, I just can't tell you how bad it is to get bugs indoors. Uh, and then there's the powdery mildew. And, and to me, powdery mildew, I, I call it the herpes of cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I call it that. I've had, the, I've had the, that's another problem I had last year, too. So you yep. got, yeah. Yep. So, so herpes, uh, herpes is a forever disease. You get it. You've got it for life. There's no cure. You don't always have a sore, right? But you're going to get one. And you're probably going to get it right, you know, when you're you're going out on that first date with that new girl, you know? Uh, and with powdery mildew, it's probably going to happen right when you're going into flower. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and you're not going to see it until then. But you can't cure powdery mildew. It, yeah. it is, it is, it gets into the plant. It gets right into the flesh of the plant. And it's actually a mushroom. I don't know. A lot of people don't know that, but oh, it wow. is a fungi. Yeah. And that white powder you see, I've looked at it under an electron microscope, and it looks like a forest of mushrooms. Right. I, you know, it makes sense because it's mildew, right? Mildew is a mold. Mold's a fungus. It, so that totally a, makes sense, right? And, and, and fungi have mycelium, okay? That's right. what they grow out of. And that mycelium is put into your plant. And once that plant gets in, uh, once that mycelium gets into the flesh of a leaf, it's in there forever and it'll spread through the whole plant. And it won't always be there. It won't always show. But when the conditions get right, the humidity, the temperature get just right, boom, oh, it's everywhere. Now is you that genetic? Like I, I'm, I've heard before that it, that once it's in the seed, then it's passed on as well. Is that true, or is it just no. because of clone? Okay, so no, cloning it, would be though. Like if you're getting, say, you're getting a, a a cutting off a plant that isn't say per se showing powder mildew, but already has it in in the plant. If you get clones right. off that plant, then that will pass it on like that, right? Genetically. Exactly. Right. Yes, okay. That's absolutely now I understand. Okay. Uh, yeah. Seeds, seeds do not come with bugs or disease. So okay. you know, if you really want to avoid all that stuff, start from seed. Right. Well, that's one thing. That's that's why I was asking that because I've heard that that's obviously not true. Then that you know, once you've got like the Kush strain, which is you know prolifically kind of like prone to powdery mildew for some reason, um, I was told that it could be in the genetic seed itself. So if that's not the case, and it's just come off a clone, then that it, makes it more is. sense. It okay. is. You, you always catch it from someone else when the plant is in the flesh. So uh, you know, there. Let's put it this way: it, whether it's hemp or it's cannabis. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people probably don't know this, but the powdery mildew that gets on cannabis is specific to cannabis. In fact, all the powdery mildews out there are specific to the plant that it, that it is on. So uh, powdery mildew on cucumbers only gets on cucumbers. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a powdery mildew on a cucumber and it's next to your cannabis plant, it's not going to give it to your cannabis plant. Oh, so interesting. When you've, got, when you've got huge fields of hemp and other people growing cannabis, 
there are powdery mildew spores flying in the air. They get up into the jet stream. They can go for miles and miles and miles, and they're gonna they're all over the place. And eventually, one's gonna land. One of those little spores is gonna come down, and it's gonna land on one of your leaves, right. and it's just gonna sit there, and it's gonna wait and wait and wait until the humidity and the temperature are just right and then it's going to go boom and it's going to put a little root of, of mycelium into your plant and it's game over from there wow that's very interesting because you know you don't really think of it like that and, and like you said i didn't know like the way you explained it like you said it's a spore so it's totally different than just it's a totally different conception of of contagion you know what i mean like it, it gets right in yes. there it's, it's not the same as a bug at all no no nope. Powdery mildew, but we also, you know, you can get into the bud rot. Now, that, right, that's, that's called botrytis. Right. So what what are the basic, um, I guess, settings for that? What do you want to avoid to avoid getting that? Uh, well, it, it's similar to powdery mildew in that it creates spores. Uh, those spores will land on your plant and they wait for real damp conditions. When it gets really damp, that's when you get the botrytis. Um, some people call it bud rot. Um, the biggest mistake people make is trying to reach in there with their fingers and, and grab that, that gooey little piece of bud that, that's just mold and, and they grab it with their fingers and they pull it out of there and they think, oh, good, I got that out of there. No, you didn't. What you did was you just released millions and millions and millions of spores. <laughs> no, like, yeah. 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 So yeah. now it's going to spread. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got botrytis or bud rot, what you want to do is you want to take a plastic bag, a plastic grocery bag from the store. It works really well. Um, you don't want to try to dissect that and get that little piece or that rotten part out of there. Um, it's it's better to just slip a bag over top of it, hold it tight around the stem with your fingers and then make a cut below the bag. And take that whole bud off, and, and I know you're sacrificing a bud, but honestly, <laughs> for the better good, you want to take that thing and take a walk as far away as you can get yeah. and discard that thing somewhere where it's not going to come back to haunt you. But that yeah. is the best way to deal with botrytis. Uh, plucking that out of there simply makes it worse. Yeah. And that, again, these are great tips for people to that, you know, you can all go back, also watch, um, like I said, Ross has got... BMA Hydroponics on YouTube too. You can go back and watch videos. I'm sure all this information will be on any one of his uh, one of his videos because there's a lot to growing. Like I know a lot of people think, oh well, you know, it's seed and dirt, and you know, it's it is it is just a seed and dirt, and it is just a plant. But yep. there are things that you have to be mindful of. You have to be mindful of disease. You have to be mindful of bugs, temperature, which is another huge thing in your room. So. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that too, because what is your ideal temperature to be, you know, growing in? Um, so, uh, ideal temperature. So now we're getting to indoor. So, uh, indoors is, is another specialty of mine. I'm doing some consulting work right now for some rather large growers. And, um, I can tell you right now that your, your best atmospheric, um, conditions for indoors are, are between 40 and 60% humidity. And so let's say between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I, I like to use Fahrenheit for temperatures uh, just because it is um, more accurate than Celsius it, because they're saying 10, 11, 12, right. 14 degrees yeah. in Celsius. If they made it like 14.1, 14.2, 14.3, I'd use it because it would be more accurate. Uh, but it's just smaller increments with, with Fahrenheit. So I always use Fahrenheit uh, for my temperatures just, again, because it's more accurate. So. 70 to 80 degrees, 70 to 80 Fahrenheit, and between uh, 40 to 60 percent humidity. If you can maintain that uh, gradient through your whole indoor grow, you will never have any problems with with powdery mildews or anything else. Um, and even bugs. Uh, if it's too hot in your room, things like spider mites love hot, dry conditions, and they'll really, really proliferate in, uh, under hot, dry conditions. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and powdery mildew indoors. Um, a lot of people think, oh, it gets too humid, and, and I got powdery mildew because it got hu too humid. No. It, it's not about being too humid. It's about extremes. So if you're at 80 or 90 percent humidity, or if you're at 10 or 20 percent humidity, both of those, powdery mildew loves both of those. So yeah. it's not about it being hot or humid or anything like that. It's about extremes. It, it, it loves the extremes. Right. And the bugs love the heat. 
Like I find if I keep my yep. room about 72 degrees, about 72, yep. 73, I don't usually yep. have any problems with any bugs or, or powdery mild, mildew either. And my humidity levels are always at about 43%. And I don't know why, but that's just where the basement seems to sit. And it's, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not complaining at that because I don't really yep. want it any higher than that either. Right. So yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, it, I don't have an ideal grow room. I'm, you know, I'm a grow a grower in my basement, just, you know, trying to make, you know, grow a couple plants, but there are some really good, decent growers out there that have learned so many things from so many of, you know, in our community, you being one of them included. And I know that, you know, the store, you guys have expanded into Kingston um, with your stores and, mm -hmm. and, and are doing um, our, our Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society still has the clinic that runs out of um, the store. So yep. you guys are busy, 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 and we and are. that and that's great because you know with COVID and everything, I, I think we were talking about this before too that it kind of made inspired people because they were home that they had the time, and I think that's what people find too. Like really, cannabis growing is is time you have time consuming. Four plants aren't so much, but if you've got more than four plants, if you're a patient and have anywhere between twenty and forty plants growing, that's time consuming. So if you're not home all the time, you might not have time to be able to put your full potential into your garden where with you know being home for the last you know few months people well people are starting to go back to work but when they were home they had that six month opportunity oh, yeah. to really you know put their effort into their gardens and really learn did you find a lot more people coming into the market then ross oh yeah yeah a, a lot and you're absolutely correct uh covet has actually Helped us, uh, you know. I, I I don't want to benefit from other from suffering or anything, but yes, it has. And and we actually run uh, commercials on radio, and uh, one of them is is got to do with it. And, and what I say in that one is, what are you doing with all that spare time? Cultivate while you isolate. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get you the MP3s for those commercials, so you guys can play them on the radio. Yeah, but absolutely. I've got all kinds of really good commercials. I got this one uh, radio station here that lets me say anything I want. You know, <laughs> who grows big buds? You do if you shop at BMA Hydroponics. <laughs> 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 that's great well because that's exactly what people should be doing it's legal to grow four plants yes. you can grow them yes. as big as you want in your backyard you could have leds in your basement you can have ballast you can have whatever as long as you've got four plants you're right under the legal reg you know regulations you Absolutely. can grow them as big as you want if you've got a 12 foot ceiling yep. in your living room you can have yep. lights in your living room and light them up you know, yep. like, and, and people have been, and I think that's what we always wanted to see, you know, overgrow the government was, you know, <laughs> one of our stances, right? So this is, is one way that we have, you know, come full circle, I guess, with legalization. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, the government thought, oh, you know, we've got to let them grow. And at first they talked about trying to restrict it to a one meter height and all this other bullshit. Right. And, and they finally relented on that and they said, well, well, We'll give them four plants. What can they do with four plants? Yeah. Well, I can only grow two in my backyard. Yeah, I know. I see the size because of Because the one <laughs> last year yielded 3.3 pounds, and the other one yielded 2.2 pounds. So from two plants, I got 5.5 pounds. So to me, four plants means 10 or 12 pounds. That's great, though. So if you come and see us, we'll make that happen for you. And... When you grow 10 pounds in your four plants, the likelihood of ever having to spend money to actually spend money on cannabis ever again is probably not in your cards, right? So right. ultimately, cannabis freedom is, is obtained by being self-sufficient. It's like anything if you're yeah. self-sufficient, right? Um, yeah. I personally have not actually paid actual money for cannabis. I mean, I've bartered it, I've traded it, I've done all this stuff, but I have not actually paid money for cannabis for 30 years. No, that's, that's, <laughs> and and that's the way it start. should be. You yes. know, and that's the way it should be. It should be, I've always stayed the kind of the barter. You, what do you got? I got, you know, share and share amongst yes. each other. And, yeah. you know, but, you know, then, yes. you know, what happens? That's cartels get, <laughs> cartels got involved. And, 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 I, and I have people coming in, in back in the fall and they've got a harvest and, and they're going, oh, geez, I got to trim all this weed. What am I going to do with all this weed? And I always say to them, well, do you know anybody who can't grow? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's lots of people that can't grow. Give them some. Just yeah. give it to them. You yeah. know, like, here, here's a gift for you. Make it a Christmas present or a birthday present. But and legally you can, 30 grams. You can legally gift somebody 30 yes, grams. You can. So yes, you can. give it away, yeah, if you can. And if you've got extra, pass it on because, 
you never know when time you might be out. Somebody might want to pass them on to you. Right on. Spread the wealth. That's what I say. Yeah. And if you're medical, that's even more so. I mean, you can, uh, you've can you given up more to share. And, and you're not just sharing it for recreational purposes. You're helping people with their medicine. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing that we're, you know, is dear to our heart. That was our mandate right from the get-go is dignified absolutely. access for everybody. And I wouldn't say it's all dignified, but let's face it, most people have access now. So yep. we did get there with, with legalization for access. Like I said, it's oversaturation in some areas to the point where there's a pot store on every corner, like there is here now. And yes. the affordability level, I must say, is coming down to where you can go in and get three and a half grams for under $30. So, yeah. you know, it might not be, you know, top and notch, but it's not bad. And mm -hmm. like I said, that's what our mandate was. I mean, there are some aspects with overregulation still I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It's not the greatest, nope. but, um, but it's, it's better than what we had. And I gotcha. think that's where I'm, I'm grateful that nobody, I don't hear kids getting busted for smoking pot. You know what I mean? You don't hear yeah. people getting busted for smoking on the having street. Their, yeah. Having their lives ruined because they, they smoked a little pot. I mean, that was just uh, the worst kind of thing that you could think of you know being well uh, listen, eight, how many eight, how many small how many small possession busts have you heard about in the last three years like i mean we've oh. heard about a few grows and stuff you know that that and this but i mean in reality how many small possession char i read my newspaper i check my rcmp there's yeah. been no cannabis bus in my town since legalization yeah. not one uh, here i'll tell you a little story about a customer um customer comes in the store uh this is last year last spring uh, he puts a bunch of stuff up on the counter, and I, I can see that he's going to grow his four plants, right? So I'm, I start talking with him. I always try to chat it up a bit with the customers, and we got talking. And, uh, you know, sometimes I mention the clinic, you know, and I say, uh, you know, well, I always say, you know, are you medical when I'm cashing them through? Because if you are medical, we give you a discount, right. right? So I said to him, are you medical? And he looks back at me and he says, oh, I wish. Okay, you know, no, I can't just leave that sitting there. Right? It's like, <laughs> right. Well, what do you mean, I wish? He says, oh, I got job problems. And I said, oh. job problems? You know, again, you can't leave that one alone. What do you mean, job problems? So he pulls out his wallet and he shows me his badge. Uh. And he says, undercover drug enforcement. <laughs> you know, five years ago i would have shit my pants right? oh my god yeah. but i said oh cool <laughs> you know, he puts his wallet back in, 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 in his pocket so i i can't leave that alone i've got to talk oh my more right god, yes. so, I, so i said to him so so what's the deal with cannabis now and he says he just goes ah he says you know what if we find some piled on top of a pile of meth and coke you know maybe we'll throw it into the charges but honestly we just don't give a crap he says, and if you're medical, even less so. We just don't even want to hear it. <laughs> he, he says to me, he says, I said, well, so what's the job problem? And he says, well, the supervisor at our station, uh, one of the guys there, one of the other cops there got uh, a medical permit. So the supervisor is real down on it. And he's, you know, so he was riding this guy's ass, you know, and talking about, you know, he's a smoking weed and he's doing all this shit right so he basically gave him a hard time so he said but this guy's only got two years till retirement we're all waiting for him to go so that we can all go out and get our medical permits and grow all the weed we want <laughs> <laughs> so there's the position from uh, long <laughs> i know right like you know i could they, they didn't care before really it was more paperwork and if they could avoid the paperwork they would have rather i mean plants and stuff yeah. and big cultivations and that kind of thing and when it comes to you know drugs and guns and okay you yeah, know but they, when it comes to they, small possession but then but then there's you know on the other hand and but if they caught you they didn't really have the option to like i got nailed for six grams possession when the cop could have thrown it in the garbage yeah. and he didn't it was all up to their discretion it just depends on the cop you had and i had some it, pretty it, shitty cops it, right well, like I say, the supervisor was a real asshole, right? Yeah. He's one of, he was the one of those old school pricks that would have charged you for one gram. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the other guys, they're you know they're younger. They grew up with cannabis, right? Yeah. And they've been using it. Yeah. And it's nothing new to them. And and when they start to see the devastation that's caused by things like fentanyl and and cocaine right. and all these other drugs, they 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 don't understand why cannabis was ever a big deal to start with so right. they're they're the younger ones 
who grew up with it, they understand that this is not a problem, that the real problem lies in the harder drugs. Yeah. In fact, I heard that in British Columbia, there was 176 yeah. deaths just last month. And if you start looking at comparing that to how many COVID deaths there were in BC, I think yeah. it, those hard drugs yeah. they are worse you know, then COVID. We lost, we lost five here in Cranbrook in one week. Wow. And wow. we have a population of 20,000 yeah. people. Yeah. And on that note, unfortunately, we have to, sadly as it is, and happily as it is, we have to thank our sponsors, which are you. <laughs> 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 so we're going to take a quick three-minute break and thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back. You've been listening to us live on paceradio.net. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. At Legacy 420, we believe in being different. Experience the difference of quality control. Our labs provide tested formulations for all of our products. Experience the difference in trust. Our customers can trust that we are following up-to-date COVID precautions for their safety. Experience the difference in accessibility. We're open seven days a week. Please visit our website, Legacy420.com, or contact us for curbside pickup as well as nationwide mail order shipping. Legacy 420 values overall wellness. Come and experience the difference of Legacy 420. The People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada is an organization working to improve cannabis legalization in Canada. They have a mission and values that includes all Canadians no matter where they come from. The values are including everyone as no one should be excluded from participating, equality, diversity, advocacy, along with cannabis education and research plus industry safety and professional standards. If this is an organization that has the same values as you, check them out at People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada dot CA. Once again, People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada dot CA. Check them out. Enjoy the buzz of legalization with Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. From lights to plant nutrients, books, consumption accessories, and more, we've got all your basics to grow or consume cannabis. Visit our info center or take a look at our piercing services and body jewelry, now available in-store through Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. 17 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. What do you find at paceradio.net? People advocating cannabis education. A doctor's job is to relieve your pains. And when it comes to growing cannabis, the biggest pain is trimming. Let Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions take the pain away. Whether you're a home grower or a commercial operation, we have the cure. From four plants to 400 plants, garden size doesn't matter. Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions comes to you with years of experience and professional discreet service. It's simple. We trim your weed and we do a damn good job. Visit drbuckcts.com to book your your trimming. CTCP operates medicinal cannabis signing clinic. If you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada, then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call. They can be reached at 1-613-967-9888. That's 1-613-967-9888 and grow on with CTCP. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like WIC, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponic System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net. All right, and we're back with Ross talking a little bit about uh, opioid addiction over the break and how it's affecting our communities so deeply. And we were saying, you know, 176 and... British Columbia and Ross, you were saying you have a, a nephew that's working for you that's overcome with cannabis. 
Yes, uh, he, he did have an addiction earlier in, in his teens. Uh, he's now in his 20s, and uh, he strictly uses cannabis and cannabis only now and is a big proponent of it as a harm reduction uh, method. And of course, uh, with the clinic and, and with our nurse practitioners that work with us, we all understand uh, about what harm reduction is. And um, to te get someone who's on, um, you know, uh, I don't know, heroin or, or, or some fentanyl or whatever, and getting them onto methadone is really just a Band-Aid solution because yeah. methadone is just another opiate yeah. and you're still addicted to it. Yeah. So ideally, you want to get people off of those addictive drugs. And cannabis is an excellent harm reduction alternative to addiction. So just for that alone, I, I would say probably... 20%, two out of 10 uh, people who go through our clinic are on hard drugs and are in a program or, or on their own trying to get off of these hard drugs and using cannabis as a harm reduction alternative. Absolutely. Well, we see what's going on in, in Vancouver. We see what's going on in Halifax, too, with, their, with the, the cannabis substitution programs that are running. And I do believe that cannabis can it can be used for harm reduction in, in huge ways. And we have all these, you know, resources and agencies too, but you just have to wonder, like we were talking about, like why the why the drugs are so bad and they're toxic and they're killing people. They're not even drugs, it's poison. And yep. you know, borders are closed and what, what you know, what is clean would be coming across the borders and they're they're busting that and, and I understand yep. that. We want to cut the, you know, we don't want our children accessing meth and we don't want our kids accessing we don't want our kids accessing any of these bad drugs. We'd hope to God that they don't ever use them. But we have to face reality that there's always gonna be trauma and mental illness and something that's gonna want somebody that's gonna want drugs. No matter, no matter what, it's, it's, it's never going to be a problem solution solved yep. where there's going to be no drugs on, available on the streets. That's, that's yep. a pipe dream. Not gonna happen. That's and, just and not going to happen. The pandemic is, is amplifying the problem because it's creating a lot of mental health issues. So people are, uh, you know, and getting to see a doctor nowadays is harder than ever. So quite often people are self-medicating and they're self-medicating with the wrong things and then they become addicted to it. And here we go round and around yeah uh, so, yeah and that's why i think partly why the death rate is so high in british columbia and, and in other province, provinces with addictive drugs is because of the pandemic yeah well the pandemic here uh, to be fair um we've never been locked down um i mean we've had our restaurants are now seated again our schools were never shut in british columbia like the, the first part of the pandemic they were but from September on, our schools have all been open. Our kids have all been in school. People have been working, working from home. Um, our grocery stores, everything, like, I don't know what we've done different comparably to the rest of the country. But we've never, quite personally, I've never felt like we were in a lockdown. Like, well, I could go to the grocery yeah. store. I had to wear a mask. I didn't feel I was being oppressed. It was a mask. I have to wear shoes and a shirt to walk into a grocery store too. So right. the mask wasn't really a big deal for me. Yeah. I'd go in, grab my essentials. I didn't have to run for toilet paper or, you know, there was no toilet paper shortage. Yeah. So I guess it depends on where you were in the country. I know Ontario, you guys had, you know, had stores locked down. Things were a, little, were yeah. a lot different in Ontario, Manitoba yeah. as well. Quebec had a curfew. But for us in British Columbia, like I said, I don't know what we've done right or wrong, but maybe it's because I'm out rural. We've never had more than about 15 cases in total in the whole town at a time. So um, we, should we say we've been lucky? Yeah, we, we, we were lucky. Um, mm -hmm. we, it, it, did it skip over us? No, it didn't. Fernie had quite an outbreak. Um, we've had, you know, the area. But it, like I said, we were never... At, our restaurants have either been on the patio or, to, like, it's never been shut down completely. Like nothing, except for the first part of March <clears throat> when the, when COVID first started, at yeah. least in my area. So I, I can't say it's been, uh, I, I don't know. I've got a big backyard. We've got beautiful lakes and, and mm. lots of space. Yep. So people have been going and doing so. It's It's been kind of the same for us to uh, where we are in, in Belleville in eastern Ontario. Uh, the case load has been really low here and uh, we've been doing really well. Unfortunately, we're only an hour and a half away from the GTA, oh, and yeah. the GTA has got an enormous problem. So if we, they don't lock us down, what happens is all the people who are locked down in the GTA Come go, to you. Hey, yeah. they're not locked down out there. Let's go drive out there, yeah. right? And yeah. then they bring it all with them out here. So they have to lock us down, too, because yeah. they don't 
on people bringing the COVID out to here yeah. where we have low, low case counts, but it's kind of unfair to us because we're doing everything right. Yeah. We're watching out for it. We're making sure it's not spreading. Um, you know, here, here at BME Hydroponics, we, we've been lucky enough to be deemed as an essential service. Um, number one, because we do run a clinic, so we're under the health category, we're essential. And as a uh, agricultural supply chain, we're also an essential service because crop failure for a medical cannabis patient is not an option. So right. we've been lucky enough to stay open during the lockdown uh, with reduced uh, numbers of people. There's a formula we had to use. We're allowed six people in the store at a time and stuff like that. But we're one of the lucky businesses that has been able to do that. There are so many other businesses that haven't been able to do that. Right. And I feel guilty, honestly, I feel guilty for being open and, and for being busy and, and being successful and doing well while others suffer. And some people go under, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's a, it's a dichotomy that 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 kind of sits with me all the time, and I'm fighting that. <laughs> that well, yeah, but you have to think of all the years of people when cannabis was illegal, and you guys sat and struggled and suffered through because people yeah. would have to sneak over to your store, and oh, yeah. you know, beat of darkness. Oh my God, I'm gonna go get some rock wool. You know what I mean? Yeah, Even as right. patients, we felt that way. Oh, I need nutrients. What, what I need to get them, but yeah. I don't want nobody seeing me get them. Even though oh. you had paperwork to get, you know, to yeah. to grow yeah. them, you just felt like a, yeah. like you were having to sneak under the. Uh, out of, of some you know so you know for, to be fair Ross you guys did you guys struggled through all those years of illegal mm -hmm. cannabis we did. and, and, those and were, didn't were, do well and you weren't yeah. you know and things weren't going so good so good for you guys sure. and congratulations to you and Deb because you guys Thanks. deserve it like like I said yeah. you're you, you know we're all in this cannabis partner society you guys do all the work I just sit back and look good <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true you, <laughs> you know that's all that's all I, I have nothing to do what, what am i supposed to be you know you guys do all the work out there i'm not i'm too far away but boy i wish i was out there because yes i would rather be doing than sitting that's for sure but i'm so glad you guys are successful and and, and helping so many patients and that's and, and like i said helping us too you're a sponsor for our network um yeah. you guys do your own youtube which helps more people which gets more information out to patients and then yep. the cannabis clinic, which is helping hundreds of people, and that's where we want to be. Now, um, can we touch a little bit on the consultation? Is it over? Is it that seventy-five day consultation closed now? Yeah, um, the, it is. It closed, I believe, on May seventh, and yeah. they're going to come out with a uh, what we heard document. I've seen these before, and usually, what they hear is what they selectively decide to listen to. Right. So um, I did put in um, a consultation um, on behalf of uh, the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society, of which you are the president. And um, I made it clear to them that uh, they're the ones who created the problem. The problem that they are addressing is with um, multiple large medical permits being ganged up on single
pretty much, you know, then they're going to be able to take that standard higher. Like, because you're right, they do produce tobacco. Like, um, not so much here on our reservation, I don't think, but in, in Ontario, I know I've seen bags oh, yeah. of smokes and stuff from over there. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's big here, yeah. <laughs> yeah in so fact, I, it was the big business on, on the territory uh, until cannabis came along, and it's now only second to cannabis. You know, like, it's still a big industry. They still sell a lot of cigarettes. Um, but now they sell more cannabis than they do cigarettes, and uh, maybe that's a good thing. Absolutely, it's a good thing. Less cancer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. In fact, uh, you know, you could look at it as being uh, possibly preventing cancer. Who knows, right? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we know that cannabis is medicine for so many people. Like, the numbers were at 420,000, you know, licensed medical cannabis patients in Canada the last time I checked on, on the stats on that. And there were so many that were, uh, was it uh, 40,000 licensed producer and the rest were all growing. And that's mm -hmm. a large percentage of people that are actually growing their own medicine finally. And those mm -hmm. are the numbers that we started back when I was, you know, 2011 was 10,000 in total. And that mm -hmm. wasn't all growing. That was just 10,000 cannabis patients. Now there's 420,000 of us. And I that's know. growing daily. So yes. that's, that's phenomenal that that many people are turning to cannabis rather than turning to pills, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more thing I'm just going to touch on briefly, and I can only do it briefly by law. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's, that is that the battle continues. Yeah. yeah. Um, court battles continue. Yeah, I know. Um, medical cannabis access is not over. Um, I am allowed only to tell you that there is a case in action right now. It has to do with the medical cannabis, cannabis dispensary owner who was uh, arrested, um, charged and convicted, and then it was appealed to the Superior Court and is now with the Superior Court. For some reason, um, the Superior Court judge decided that they were going to put a publication ban on any of the details. So that's why, by law, I can't say any more than what I've already said. I don't think I've said anything more than what's common knowledge. Uh, but if we win this one, um, let's just say that there could be a, a medical cannabis dispensary system that's federally regulated across the country. And that's all I can say about it. Well, we'll keep that in our thoughts and prayers. Yes. So fingers crossed. Um, we're hoping for the best final arguments are in September. Yeah. I don't think there's a publication ban on that. There's no, just, uh, no, no. I, no, there isn't. Yeah. I yeah. think you're good. But yeah, no, that's... Uh, I think a lot of us are, are waiting that. And then, like Sarah and Sean also had their... Um, uh, court day in uh, in Alberta, and they won, and they were going to go ahead and appeal, but just because Sean was convicted too, right? Like he didn't get uh, off on the charges, and it was for cultivation, so they were going to go ahead to Supreme Court too, but they decided they can't afford to do that right at this time. So, right, and that's a part of it is the money um, to to try to afford to defend yourself against you know these charges. It, it, right. It's not cheap. It's no. not cheap. No. So um, I don't. I don't have. I, I haven't discussed it with him for a while. So I don't. As far as I know, they're 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 growing bees. <laughs> 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 they were getting bees and uh, and uh, more chickens, and and they're living off grid up up north and up, uh, up near uh, Fort St James. It's a beautiful place. Uh, <laughs> we, we went up there last year. It was it's beautiful. So they're living yeah. off grid and, and they're growing cannabis too, and their patients and taking care of Maya and living life right now. So yeah, and that's, that's something. Great. Sometimes you just have to take a breather. They might decide to go ahead at some point. And I don't. I don't know. I think yeah. they're just exhausted from all of it. To be fair, and yeah, I can't blame them. So I mean, that's got to be hard to deal with. Well, when you got a child too to take care of the special yeah. needs too, it's just exhausting on all levels, right? But they've done a fabulous job, and they represented our, represented our patients so well and fought so hard, yep. you know, and that's all that's all we could do as patients for each other yep. is try and, you know, stay connected and try and fight for each other and try and support each other, and mm -hmm. and that's all we can do, and that's what we've been doing on the Pace yep. Radio Network for the last six yep. years, and yep. we're going to continue to educate people, yep. and I'd like to thank you for coming on my show. I You're appreciate welcome. it. I really appreciate having you guys out there working so hard with the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society to and signing patients. It's just amazing the work you guys do out there and uh, the store. I'm so glad you're, you know, you're there to help other medical patients learn how to grow because I couldn't be asking to grow from the best too. And your YouTube channel as well as BMA Hydroponics, yes. right? Yep. Check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Um, anybody you want to shout out to before we have to turn us off? Oh, geez. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to shout out to two people like, like Sarah and, and um, 
um, Cheryl Rose and uh, people like that who, who it's personal for them, you know. Um, this is about their children. This is about their families. And um, there's a shout out to them. I, I, I admire their strength. Uh, I admire their determination. And uh, I fully support everything they do. Speaking of Cheryl and Haley, um, my GoFundMe is up and running for Haley's Get a Ride. We know it's a lot of money to be asking for them. They have found a place to live. It is farther away from VGH. Um, it's a nicer place, but it's farther away. So if anybody has any little extra money, you can go find that. Go find me um, on my page, Cheryl's page, Haley's page, um, Cannabis and Coffee, Pace Radio, or you can email me or Cheryl directly. Um, we can't take email transfers at this time because of Cheryl's disability. Um, that's why we're doing it this GoFundMe with me being the one taking the money to get to them because they can't take they can't take it because of their disability. And that's the only reason why I'm involved at all, to be fair. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you know how much I love being involved when it comes to cash, Ross. It's like, yeah, yes. yeah I don't want to be involved hey, in that shit. But, it's, a noble, it's a noble effort and I went well worth it. Yeah, so we're trying to raise, like I said, it's a lot of money. It's fifty thousand dollars, but or or if if we know somebody who's got a good, you know, used Dodge van, Dodge Caravan, but it's got to be a fairly new one or a Dodge dealership. Um, we've sent emails off to a few in my local area and have gotten no response. So we'll just keep plugging away. But we're gonna try and get Haley a ride so she can be taken around and have some quality yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, well, thank you again for coming on. We will, um, I'm not even sure who I've got lined up for next week. Um, crap. Corey Yellen, I think, actually, is who my next guest is. <laughs> I'd have to look at my list. I was always telling me, write stuff down, Tamara, and I never do. But, yeah, Corey Yellen's going to, I think, be on my next guest on my next show. And you've been listening to us live on PaceRadio.net. You all have a great week. Bye. Bye. From no pretentious media, Madonna. I found me a great ganja mama. Oh, cannabis and coffee with some marijuana.